as in quantitative research, uh, we have different study designs such as case control, cohort, In qualitative research, we have two major approaches: that is, descriptive approach and other one is interpretive approach. I'll be mentioning about what are these, but uh, won't be able to explain all of these in detail. But I'd like to mention that we have to pay attention to this approach, so we should be clear about what kind of approach I'm having. So once we have a focused research question. Once we are clear with the theoretical framework of our sexual treatment, and if when we are clear about uh, descriptive or interpretative approach, then we make a choice about uh, methods that we choose. And while I'm talking about qualitative research, uh, I'm talking about uh, something about a constructivist paradigm. So we have three major paradigms, and say that fourth one also. It's not a practice in India to think about this when we frame our masters or PhD research, but, uh, particularly in medicine. So we should start thinking about it. And here it is. Here it goes this way: that when you are doing quantitative research, you are a positivist. When you do qualitative, you are a constructive. When you are doing research for empowerment and addressing the problem through people's participation, we say that you are participatory advocacy paradigm, you are using that paradigm. And when you are using two different methods, such as quantitative and qualitative, in one single design, so you are pragmatic. So we have to be aware of these philosophical assumptions uh, when we are framing design. Come to this point as we see a comparison between quantitative later. Then comes a point that we have to ask a question what I'm doing is research or evaluation? Um, the research means you test a hypothesis, evaluation means you look whether your program was effective or not, and whether you achieved your desired outcome. So, if you are doing an evaluation, you have to think of which outcomes you are looking for and what you are looking for. So, in that case, your questions frame around that outcomes, right? Rather than coming from literature, it comes from your outcome chain. Once we are thorough with all this process, they look very simple and straightforward, but they are conceptually a little difficult because there is a risk that we may miss the point when we are making decisions on our designs or assumptions. Uh, then we make a choice about instrument, that what kind of data collection instrument, data collection and analysis would be appropriate for the research question that I choose, the methods that I have chosen. And everything has to be in alignment when we go for it. And of course, uh, all of you are familiar that we need the IC clearance, that we put the proposal, get the clearance, we form the research team. So more or less these steps are the same uh, for most of our research that we need to form the research. I'm sure you all are very familiar with the quantitative research, uh, but here so that the comparison between the two becomes easy. One is that whenever we do any research, we have to Pay attention to the assumptions that we have applied. And when we do quantitative research, we have an assumption that there is only one truth in the universe and that can be measured and verified. And quantitative research is based on that. And we have another assumption is that knowledge is objective in nature. And these two assumptions prevail. And this paradigm is called as kind of a positivist paradigm. And it was very dominant in the Second World War, and most of your hard science fits into this kind of assumption. So, data is collected in terms of numbers, uh, and the purpose of analysis is to estimate something out of that numbers, and some number can 
mentioned this morning on that. And we are all trying to do that. Best of hypothesis. We have some assumptions even for test of test of hypothesis. And then we get uh, a significant value. We value that we look for. And then we make a choice about null hypothesis or anti hypothesis based on the value that we have. Very commonly used approach in most of the research. So whatever research problem we have in our mind, we see, we try to address that research problem using this approach, very predominant approach in solving research problems. Remember the point that I mentioned earlier in my first time. The very starting point of research is the problem. And you can solve that problem either through quantitative method or qualitative method. And the very purpose of research is solving the problem. And most commonly used, uh, since I am from community medicine, my background is community medicine, I'll be quoting an example of survey. And you will see in clinical side, you have experimental kind of designs to solve the problem, the clinical problem as well. And typical examples is that we have scales, we do anthropometric measurements, we do blood samples. But in qualitative, we have to think a little differently. Uh, it is based on assumption uh, that knowledge is constructed. There is multiple reality, means there is no one way of looking the situation. People look at the same thing in a different ways. Right? And when that comes, uh, then we call it as oh, there are multiple facets to it. People interpret the same thing in a different way. Education is highly constructed in nature. One single thing, people have different ways of looking at it. And one if we plan any one particular intervention, people have different opinions on it. So having this different opinion makes it uh, constructive. People have different viewpoints on the same thing, and that makes it difficult to comprehend sometimes. This paradigm became prominent after Second World War, and most of the universities in uh, Western countries started operating this paradigm in their research training. And somehow it was lagging in our system. We didn't pay much attention to qualitative trainings and which we need to. And then another assumption it has apart from constructed, it has that knowledge is subjective in nature. It deals with text information. So there is no number collection. However, there are examples, some qualitative methods to collect numbers and uh, they need it uh, and I'll be telling you the examples of those methods later but even though we use some numbers in qualitative research they are not for any statistical generalization but they just tell the salience of that item in that particular body of text information. The data is collected and instead of word Analysis, I'm using the word organization and interpretation. The purpose is to get more insight, develop new understanding, and develop analysis. Now, here comes a question. For example, in, I often put that example about tobacco consumption as a, as a medical doctor. We all know that as a people from health patient background. We all know that tobacco is harmful to health, right? But then do community also perceive that in the way or do they have some beliefs or values or their sentiments attached to it? Uh, we need to test that, right? We need to check for that. And I'll be giving you one example that it's less commonly used, less practice. And among them, whosoever use it, the commonly used techniques are interviews and group techniques such as focus groups. Now, here is an example. This is how your qualitative information looks like. And those who are from clinical background, they understand that your history taking motivation as a part of your clinical practice is a kind of an interview that you give the patient. And you get a lot of qualitative information that 
can be used that for drawing some conclusion for the patient, some diagnosis for the patient. Here's an example. Can you give me an example of good professional behavior in medicine? So, this conference says professionalism in medicine is such a difficult thing to define. I guess thinking of people who have impressed me in the past, they have shown honesty, respect for patient, clinical competence. Actually, sometimes it is easier to think of examples of good professional behavior. So, there is a kind of uh, text information coming, and qualitative researchers collect this text information and they try to make meaning of it. What do they do to make me feel? So, the one thing I'm touching on is now definition of qualitative research that it is an exploratory research to gain understanding of underlying reasons, opinions, and motivations from our decisions. Now, these last three, four words are very important from part, participants point of view. And many a times, just to interview with seven people, what's the guarantee that people will speak truth in that? And that fear is actually coming from post positive paradigm. And people will see knowledge as an objective reality. But qualitative research, as I told you, is based on that assumption that, that subjective knowledge is also a way of being. That's also what we are looking at. So when you do interviews from participant point of view, you have to accept it the way it is coming. So it helps you to develop ideas or hypotheses for potential quantitative question. So when you are not sure about framing a research question, and when you are new to the field, or when that topic is new to you, or when there is not much literature available. The best way would be to start with qualitative inquiry. Interview some people, get some ideas, generate the hypothesis for your quantitative research. So, in that way, it will improve the rigor of your quantitative phase of research. As I told you, it belongs to constructive paradigm means the knowledge is constructed here. Now, basic purpose of qualitative research is to know why people behave in they do so. For example, why your some patients take complete course of treatment and why your some patients do not comply to the therapy. And if you want to know answer, give the answer to that question why, the best start would be to use qualitative research. Right? Why people think in the way they do so? One is behavior, second is about thinking. Behavior you can observe, but thinking we cannot observe. So if we want to know why people think in the way they do so, we have to interview them. We have to access their thought process. And the best method would be to do the interview, either one to one or two to one. So people have perceptions and we want to know why they have it. Then another situation is if you are working in organizations and you have responsibility of mentoring groups, managing human resources, and you may have questions why some organizations or programs or group of people are successful or failure. So in that case also we can do a qualitative research to find out, okay, what are the success factors? Okay, what are those barriers? And if we know, we can solve those. And finally, if you know that certain things work and certain things don't work, then the next step that you would like to know about how that thing happens. What is the process in that? In doing, exploring those steps which leads to the success. Now, how is qualitative different from quantitative? At this time, it must be clear to you that they are very different from each other. And comparison between the two uh, is uh, is actually uh, a problematic and very difficult question to answer. But in order to understand it, this comparison is done here. First, they are different in their assumption, as I told you. Quantitative has single truth assumption, 
knowledge is objective in nature. Major. They estimate. They go for statistical generalization. They take a sample and they get estimate out of it and they generalize it to wider knowledge. They go for probability sampling. They develop a questionnaire for data collection which are based on some selected variables related to the research mission. They use a representative sample so that the findings can be statistically generalized. And they have sampling frame and they use that frame for selection of their sample. In qualitative, the assumption is that the knowledge is constructivist in nature, so it's constructivist by line, and reality is subjective. They don't look for estimation, but what they look for is exploration and understanding the phenomenon from the participant's point of view, as I mentioned in the definition. They go for non-probability sampling. They don't develop a questionnaire, but they develop an interview guide which consists of some open-ended questions. And they do study on small sampling size. And sampling trend not defined and uh, sometimes not available. But maybe in some cases, in your hospital, if you have a list of people who are not complying to your therapy and you want to interview five of them, for example, then you have a sampling trend. You can choose people subject to a study participants. Now here comes a question. I have kept a star on generalization and I have not commented anything on the qualitative side of it. And I'll try to answer it in the end of my presentation. In qualitative, we have two major approaches, descriptive and interpretative. And descriptive is just like your descriptive quantitative research. Uh, here we just describe those and categories. And second are interpretative designs and under which we have ethnography. Trying to understand the culture from people's point of view. Phenomenology trying to explore the lived-in experience of patient or student. For example, what is your lived-in experience of undergoing a medical course at XYZ University? What is your lived-in experience of living with, with cancer pain? Or what is your lived-in experience of being a caregiver of a patient with dementia? All these situations can be studied using phenomenology. Phenomenologists are interested in current experiences. And phenomenography means uh, we deliver something to set of students. But students will understand pieces of it and can have, we can use that very much in educational reason that is what we do today lecture has been received by the student by using but if you want to develop your own theory by using an empirical data to explain some unexplained phenomena then you can use a grounded theory or if you want to develop some intervention for program based on some middle range theory then you can go for grounded theory which in fact is a, is a very, very interpretative design for the research. And then there are participatory action research. You involve people in taking actions, you empower them as a part of it. And now in medical education, there is a thing called design based research. They are encouraging to use this kind of mixed method research for problem solving in educational settings. Whatever research, let it be quantitative or qualitative, we have to think of sample size and sample. So for those who are worried about statistics, for them good news is that in qualitative research, we don't have any problem for sample size calculation. But then and that brings a big responsibility to the researcher because they have to make a decision about how much sample size would be adequate to study that question and you have to keep one thing in mind that the sample size and quality research is driven by the purpose of the study and the quality
out of saturation. Means the point at which you don't get any new information, you can say that okay, we have achieved the point of saturation. And sampling is of two types. Mainly we use a non-probability sampling, and it's of two types. Purposive sampling, there are 15 types of purposive sampling, and you have to choose one of them which is appropriate to your research question. And then finally, if you are building a theory, you have to use a theory driven sampling technique for that. So I'm just putting these terms to you so that when you go for developing your first proposal, you should be familiar that okay, there is a thing like that, and you have to keep those things in mind. Go ahead with it. There are different ways of classifying qualitative methods, and I put it in this way. And my professional background probably will be there, so the way I put it here. One is participatory research techniques. It involves different stakeholders for participatory planning, monitoring, and evaluation. And if you are a medical educator and you want to use these kinds of techniques, you may refer to Amy Guide number 60, where you can think about how we can use participatory philosophy in educational research. In depth techniques such as one to one interview, group techniques, and if you want to read about those in detail, how to use those, you can refer to AME guide number 91. AME means Association of Medical Educators in Europe, and you just write down that Google and you will retrieve this guide from the medical region. Third techniques are systematic such as free list, file sort, nominal group technique called as NGT or delta technique. Here we do a lot of number crunching and these methods are bit rapid and they help us to understand the things in a, in a, in a quantified way. And fourth, which we consider very powerful source for qualitative data observations. And of course, we don't use them alone. Use that in combination with the methods uh, for better triangulation. So, in group techniques, we have mainly focus groups. We bring six to twelve participants, and we evoke discussion on one fixed topic. And there is one moderator, and he make that group of people to have a discussion on that topic, and they discuss and moderator encourage them to go further so that he get information, perhaps the new information that he is looking for. Group technique is more or less similar as focus group, but it's more controlled by the moderator who will ask questions to each one of them in turn and then will evoke their responses on that question. And then there is no mutual discussion. But in organizations, in programs, we often encounter with a situation where you are required to develop consensus with your program staff or with the set of educators. For them, nominal group technique and delphi techniques are important. So it is based on the assumption that wisdom lies with the group and you run round one round two round three round. And you can use these techniques not only for consensus building with educational experts, but also in your profession to build a consensus of professional guidelines, consensus on treatment guidelines. And they're very nice to describe the steps which are qualitative to begin with, but in final case there is a bit of quantification goes on. And then you get a very concrete answer, which is very easy to make the policy makers agree to it or to sell that to your stakeholders. That, okay, this is how these are the four major points that's coming. And then you make it so you have a choice here. So, having said all that points, that we have to think of what are the sources from where we get quality. And I say everything is, is, is a source for qualitative data. And our learning is a qualitative process. If 
itself. And in that, if we see that people are less we interact with each other, we talk to each other, and they generate a lot of qualitative information in that. But when we do interviews with some research question, we can use interviews as a method for collection of data. Participant observation. In hospital grounds or in at your workplace, you do these observations of human behaviors. You do observations on your patients and their caregivers. Field notes taken or notes taken during your clinical practice, reflections written by students during their postings, can be a source of qualitative data. Photographs, films are qualitative source source for quality. Diaries maintained by students, by field workers, is a quality. Reports submitted, minutes of the meetings, and press clippings, emails, online code, everything is a quality to source of data. And a lot of researchers have been using this data for addressing some research question. But still, people are very fond of asking this question. That what are the situations where qualitative research is more appropriate? And there is no perfect answer to this question. You can use qualitative methods wherever you think it's appropriate or we need it. But to answer this question, I will put it from the literature that when little is known about the topic, you can start with a qualitative research. For example, about feedback practices, stimulus reaction. You don't know. Has been the reaction to it. We explore the different perspectives of various stakeholders. If we are working in an educational setting, we would like to know what parents, students, teachers think about the new curriculum that we have launched. What is their reaction to it? If we bring any new assessment practice, there is a consensus on it. Right? Then studies of lived-in experience. I gave you an example of it. The lived-in experience as a resident of how it is to go through that. Then to explore the black box of practices such as program evaluation. Why and how did it work? Why and how did it not work? Explore the hidden curriculum. What students learn from observation in educational curriculum. Building a theory for your context. If you want to develop your theory, you want and for those who think that I don't need qualitative research at all and I just want to do a quantitative for them, I would like to tell them that if they are developing a questionnaire for their quantitative research, then there is one step in questionnaire development. There are some seven steps for developing questionnaire. In that one step is qualitative interviews to make that questionnaire more suitable to the context or more suitable study topic so that you pick up right variables for your study. And if you want to predict the future, what will be the prediction, what will be the status of the condition of education 20 years from now? What kind of technology will be needed? So we can do a delicate study of that and predict the future of research. And the qualitative research will be the most appropriate to go for it, at least to start with the exploration. So there are some perceived barriers why people don't use it, they have fears about it. I can't answer to all those, but I just mentioned these are the points. First is people think that it's time consuming. And I say it's a myth. If you're organized and uh, if you keep a good timeline, then it's going to take more or less time. And as one would think for doing a quantitative research, but yes, you need to be very organized and systematic. People hear about the subjective nature of analysis. And we don't need to worry about it because that is the assumption that the knowledge is subjective in nature. Then people have a perception that quantitative research is more superior over qualitative. Particularly to adults and policy makers, they finally want to hear numbers and they don't take interest in your anecdotal information that you produce to them. And 
that's why the next method research marketing problem where you get to learn more and the qualitative information eliminate the context around that and that makes sense because they understand okay this is the figure this is the problem 40% of my patient don't complete the treatment and these are the reasons why they don't complete the treatment now that makes sense to them so you get a complete picture at the end of your research and then many people have this feeling that it is a matter of community medicine and no it's not just practice the community medicine it's practice the education in all subjects in all disciplines in engineering marketing tourism everywhere it has application so how do people for interviews uh, I'm just giving you an example. These are more or less same for most of the qualitative methods that we choose. First, review the existing literature and choose a conceptual framework or theoretical framework. Which will what information do you want? Brainstorm for the respondent. Choose the sample size. Decide the selection of sample. Who will be your respondent? And you have to choose one type of proposal sample. Then develop the interview guidelines, means which consists of broad open-ended questions with groups. And when you actually go for one-to-one -one interview, don't pay too much, too much attention on asking questions. Of course, they are important. You have to practice it to do that. But pay attention to the listening to what you responded to say. And your next question should be based on what that person has just said to get more in-depth information for your interview. So listening is a key. So steps in conduct of interview, there are some many interview practices. Obtain the consent, also take a consent for audio recording, but I'm going to take your audio recording. Do the briefing. Look, I'm going to ask you this type of questions. This is the study topic. Is the nature of question. If anything is disturbing to you, let me know and I will stop at that. Then ask open ended question What is your opinion about the services provided by XYZ hospital? Right? And ask one idea at a time and then ask about suggestions later. But not to ask two ideas at a time. Ask for more probing questions. In the end, when your interview is done, when you get enough information, do the more briefing. Read out summary to your participant so that you do member checking. That is called as participant validation. And then say thanks to your participant. Participant or respondent. Now you have collected the data. And you have a lot of text data. And you have audio recording. And the first step is that you have to convert that audio recorded information into written form, which we call it as transcript. You write everything what was said in that interview paper. This phase is time consuming. This is going to take a time. You have to transcribe it. So you have to translate it and you have to change the spoken medium into written form. Then we have to do what are the rules for coding and what I'm going to code here. Coding means during whenever we read a book, we tend to underline it with tags and words to it. So that's coding. We have to make a choice how many people will do the coding, what type of coding we need to do. The choice of coding should be in alignment with the approach that you have chosen and should be in alignment with the research question that you have chosen. To code all the data. It all requires a practice and training. Then, when you code the data, bring similar units together to form categories. Describe the categories that is we call that we call it as descriptive level analysis. And if you are satisfied with it, good. But if you are not, then you can go to the next level called 
has interpreted it level where you can be the network which explains the phenomena such as why some students sleep in the class and we want to explain it why some doctors smoke cigarette even when they know that it is harmful to their health now these are very important research questions and we want to know why they do so even when they know that it is harmful then we draw the conclusions in the end, but these are the reasons. Reporting, then, just like you have guidelines for reporting, with various types of research in quantitative research, we have a consolidated criteria for reporting qualitative research, which has 32 item checklist. And we have to choose the items which are relevant to the research question, and then the real research topic, and methods that we have chosen. That you have chosen and use those as a guide for writing your manuscript or thesis. But that brings more transparency and rigor to your work. If you want to do content analysis or thematic analysis manually, you can do so. Human brain is the best tool for qualitative data analysis. But if you want to use any software such as Anthropan for systematic or Atlas TI or any table for your text information that you have collected for course categorization, the organization of that data. You can use the software. Uh, both are equally good. Okay? If you think that software is going to distract you from thinking, you can go for manual analysis. But if you think your data is very large, more than 10 introduce, you are likely to have plenty of codes, you won't be able to handle it manually and go for computer assisted quality. Uh, these are some of the points in the end I will mention. People ask these questions often which qualitative design is superior over others? My answer would be not to get into that, but just check whether you methods that you have chosen addresses the research question I want. If that is so, then that's perfect. Second, people ask question, what about generalizability of qualitative research findings? Uh, so, the, the, the point here is that, that the generalizability definition says that it is an act of shifting interpretation from particular to general. And there are three models for it, statistical model, Analytical model, third is transferability. So, qualitative research do not aspire for statistical generalization. They can't do. However, qualitative findings can be one of the model analytic generalizability and the transferability. And in order to read more about that, I would recommend you to read article by Pollitt and Flick on various models of generalizability. So, if you eliminate the context in which you have generalized, you have obtained your study findings in qualitative study, the reader can take the informed decision whether their findings are applicable to their setting or not. And this we call it as transferability. For example, the study panel in Gujarat on some cultural factors are for some reasons for not availing the program services. And if the context is more or less similar, or similar to mine, then I, as a reader from Maharashtra, can make a choice that okay, they are applicable to my setting as well. So, reader has to take a call and make a decision that the findings are transferable to the setting. And how to grade the quality of evidence in qualitative research? Yes, a lot of work has happened on that. The grade committee, which gives a hierarchy of evidence for it's a WHO grade, which gives a hierarchy of evidence for quantitative research also worked out the hierarchy of evidence for qualitative research as well. So you can refer and check the hierarchy of evidence in qualitative research as well. And WHO is now recommending of using this qualitative evidence in policy formulations and decision making. So these are not just going to be an academic piece, but they are going to have a concrete application in policy making and decision making. Okay. 
and how to address ethical issues. Uh, ICMR, new ICMR guidelines do offer some guidance on it. And however, we need to work with more on that as we do more research in this field. And so how to develop a concept for how to ensure privacy and confidentiality of privacy in small sample size. And how to address the uh, reputational risk to the researcher and researched as a result of the study because people ex experience, ex give their lots of personal opinions. And so how do we keep it uh, confidential? How do we report those things? Uh, how, do we keep, how do we anonymize it? All these are issues to be considered if we go for it. And that's it. Uh, so uh, I have tried to answer you some of the questions, but but for those who still feel that some questions need to be answered, uh, or you want to write to me, so my email ID is given here. You can call me over phone, and I hope I was clear enough uh, to give you at least uh, uh, initiating lecture on this field. We do conduct workshops and training programs. If you are interested, let us know. And please start doing it, not to wait for that perfect day when you can start on your own, but to start having it. And that will be uh, a good start. So I wish you good luck for you to think of using qualitative research in your project in whatever way you want. And there, there is not going to be a good or perfect start. Just have it as it comes. And finally, I'll be happy to take up your question, but before that, I would like to thank the Scientific Society of AEMC for keeping this webinar and inviting me to speak over this topic. And it was really a pleasure to come over here. So I thank all the stakeholders of your organizations for considering me to speak on this topic. So thank you very much. I hope I have addressed some of your questions that you have raised before this session. But if not, I'll be happy to take up questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, if uh, we would like to have some from Dr. Bud, sir, first, uh, we can yes. go ahead with Dr. Bud, sir. Yeah. Would like to add a few points to the presentation. It's a very interesting and I think I'm trying to impress upon the people how qualitative research is important. And as you rightly put, uh, it has become less popular maybe because people are not aware and probably they do not understand probably human behavior, psychology, education. Yeah, really cannot be directly tried like personal or numbers. So, how to make it more popular? So, you have definitely give them some insight. How to make it more popular, uh, make it more interesting to them? Keep this qualitative research. Yes. Am I audible, sir? Can I answer? Yeah, 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 yes. Yes, sir. So, that's a very important question that how to bring it and based on, because I've been teaching and practicing this for more than 10 years from now, 13 years. And I have tried teaching this to undergraduate students first, uh, then uh, we can have one at least small lecture, because we don't teach these things to undergraduates at all. And there's very little research-oriented training to undergraduates, and whatever is there, it's mainly for quantitative research. So we can have at least one lecture or some orientation for undergraduates. And also I think that if we make this session as a part of postgraduate orientation when we do their research orientation, we can have training for institutional ethics committee and research committee members. And we can keep at least one session of qualitative in all research methods events that we organize. And once people are aware, they, they go for it. And the other thing, people have a lot of phobia about it. They have a lot of fear about it. But if we start training about it right from the first year or right from the undergraduate phase till they become faculty, I think perhaps maybe because of that, it will be popular. People will start to do this. Do you think uh, the mindset of the teachers also should change? 
because yes, uh, yes. because now you put a qualitative research uh, suppose you give a dissertation what he has done in this series in education dissertation is uh, not done any experiment he has not done anything like that right. people are like to think so very true very true and uh, that, that's a very very valid point because nobody want to take a risk of using pure qualitative in thesis or research or theory that external examiners would reject it and that's really a fear so in that case then we can start using this as a part of mixed method research where they use qualitative methods to improve the rigor of their quantitative work so in that way we can because doing pure qualitative research for masters may be tough for some students and even for some guides to mentor on that but we can start using this as a part of short projects or as a mixed methods in that way we can solve this problem but the mindset is fixed it's more for quantitative but that's changing because we have done a scoping review on publications in this field for last 15 years and we have seen that there is a tremendous rise in number of publications in the mixed method publications in the last 5 years so there is a change in trend. No, Art Kohli must be having a question. Was an educationist. I don't know. I have been muted. Muted. No, no. You, you are not. You are audible, sir. You are audible, sir. We can hear you. Now you are muted. Now you have to open again. You can't hear me. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes. Audible, sir. Okay. First of all, uh, congratulations. I always enjoy listening to Dr. Amol Dongri because one of the very structured, very very, it it flows like a river. You know, his lecture is something like a river, and he has addressed the most important issue of qualitative research, which is dear to our heart. Now, as uh, Dr. Bhatt mentioned, it is the mindset and how to work. one reason for this mindset is the way in which our researchers are trained they are trained because of their influence of the biomedical and experimental tradition and qualitative tradition is quite new to them that is why there is resistance so lack of awareness leads to lack of awareness so what dr tombre uh, amol dongre told uh, if you create awareness perhaps there will be takers and one thing perhaps because of the shortage of time he did not cover very important issue in bringing credibility is the concept of triangulation and this triangulation is a weapon wherein you can say that you can uh, apply it for using mixed method on one side you are bringing quantity on one side you are bringing quality third angle is the researcher who stands in between so it is a beautiful combination of addressing questions in a holistic manner especially it will work very well in in uh, complementing the experimental research because experiments only establish which is superior or maybe why it is superior but qualitative will give, throw a lot of issues on the compliance issue the affordability issue the cultural issue the acceptability issues which is extremely more important so to my mind the future belongs to mixed method because that is the one which will give you the search for truth truth is the highest uh, evidence of any particular research so my congratulations again uh, amol dongre sir for uh, <laughs> you are one of the leaders in this uh, field so let us uh, uh, combine together our energies and make a synergy sure. and uh, try to work in this direction and also our ethical committees need to be retold Uh, uh because they don't believe they say that uh, if a lot of subjectivity they say how it is that you can be participant as well as observer they cannot understand isn't it in in, in for example in in participant observation you are a participant and you are observing and that is the way in which you are finding truth but if you put up to the ethical committee they will say there is lot of bias right. can you just comment on this issue <laughs> 
yes, sir. Uh, I will say I will say your point. Thank you, sir, for bringing up that point. Nowadays, if you see a lot of randomized controlled trials in Western countries, when they when they do it, they use a mixed method. So whenever they have an explained problem in their trial, they use a qualitative uh, methods to explore why that problem happened and how that happened. So okay. future is mixed method. We call that as a we call that as a third methodological movement, which is going on yeah. now, and we are living in that mixed method movement. So thank you for breaking up that point. So it can be very well merged with the experimental designs also. We don't deny yeah. experimental designs, but we can improve those experimental designs by using qualitative steps. And the other point, sir, that you mentioned about the ethics committee, uh, why I got into qualitative research training, perhaps the credit goes to ethics committee, because when my first proposal got turned down, and they said that it is not a science at all. You are just going to do some chit chat with five, six people. And that's not a research at all. And we don't think that it needs an ethics clearance because it's not science at all. And we felt very much humiliated, disgusted with that. And then we started first training in quality. So the training started with that way. But I say that that we have to make it make sure that that our ethics and research committee members are trained in it. And if we don't have any member trained in it, because I conduct workshops and I take follow from the participants, and nearly five to six participants every year report to me that the ethics committee turned it down because they said that there's no measurements in it, there's no science in it. And if that situation comes, then one solution could be to send that proposal to somebody else outside the ethics committee. We can take an expert but I, I see one encouraging change in ICMR guidelines. Now we have yeah. some guidance given on qualitative research. Correct. So the movement is going on and we yes, look yes. forward that we will be having Correct. stronger guidance on that. So the change is, is positive. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for the input, sir. Uh, sir there are a few questions which you would like to take, sir. Yes. Uh, so the first question is for myself. Uh, like, what is the present stand on the acceptance for publication of the mixed set method study over a pure qualitative study? Which one is more accepted? Okay. Yes. <laughs> That's difficult to answer. Fairly good acceptance to the mixed methods, provided you follow the guidelines for writing it, because the word count because writing mixed method requires a large word count, right? And so your word count exceeds. Uh, but you have to make a good balance of your qualitative and quantitative when you write it. And fairly good acceptance to mixed methods. Second, for qualitative also, I see over the last 10 years, the journals are even accepting pure qualitative research. So, so I am seeing positive trend over it. That the acceptance is coming upon. I mean, which was really very hard five to ten years from now. But now there's quite a bit of awareness about it in India. Thank you, Mr. Uh, there is a question from Dr. Prema Agarwal from Varta. Uh, she's she is asking about uh, uh, kindly elaborate on the questionnaire validation technique used in uh, qualitative studies. Okay, here is uh, what you say that we align our interview question to the research question that we have in our And that can be checked by your research team. You can give it to some external to review it. But since there are very few in number, you really don't need a very vigorous validation as you do in quantity to really develop a scale. We have to constantly keep on checking that there should be an alignment with the research question and the methods that you choose. And there should be alignment with your interview questions with the research question that you ask. You can pilot it. You can get it reviewed by some expert as well. Or a subject expert, method expert. You can give it to them. So they will tell you, that, okay, this is adequate. 
this way of asking questions. Right? My way of doing it more because my concern is more because I'm pretty sure that what I'm asking and what I'm looking for. But my question remains if I'm doing that interview in my regional language, I often give it to my social workers and tell you can say that will they understand this question if I ask it this way? I think that should be the major focus. If I'm interviewing students on it, will they understand the technical jargons that I'm going to have in my interview, right? So that should be the area of concern when we are doing that. There's one more question regarding ethical issues in video recordings used during the presentation. Your comments on ethics uh, involved in video recording. Right. Okay. We, we often do audio recording. I haven't done any video recording so far because if you have an intention of doing any body language analysis, analysis on body language or some other purpose, then we go for video recording. But I haven't done that uh, because if you are planning to go for discourse analysis, you need to take all those details. But if you don't know, if you don't need those details for your research question, then why to collect all those things? If you think that audio recording is enough, then just collect the audio recording. We say that if you collect this kind of data, such as audio, video, photographs, transcripts, we say that keep it in password protected system and declare when you write your proposal that who all will have access to those things. In that way, you can keep it confidential from others else. And when you prepare transcript, then not to write the names of participants or other details. You have to give a pseudonym so that you will not make out who said what. And there should not be any consequences for people for expressing their opinion in your interview. Or interview. So there is enough guidance on that. Thank you, sir. We don't see much questions in the chat box. My final question, sir, is. Uh, is qualitative research used as a start to quantitative research or is it to uh, ensure that the quantitative results are true? Which is the more... Okay. Right. Uh, if, if you have, you can do both way. If you if you don't have a questionnaire in your hand, if you don't have a hypothesis in hand, if you are new to topic, start with qualitative. But after doing survey, if you think that some findings are unexplained, for example, you do some intervention and as a result of intervention, people don't do that thing which you wanted them to do. Then you would certainly like, like to know why people didn't do that behavior even after your intervention. Then we can go for follow-up qualitative phase. All that comes under mixed method study. Hope I have answered you. Uh, uh, Dr. Arun. Yes, sir. Dr. Arun. Yeah, I'm uh, uh, the dean speaking, you know, Dr. Uh, Dr. Amol. Yes, sir. I, yeah, 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 I could I could join a little bit. My apologies for that. Uh, I have uh, some question related to yes. the study, whether be it a qualitative study or a quantitative study, we do the critical appraisal to ascertain the validity. Okay. Yes. To ascertain the validity of the qualitative study. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, any tips you like to give? You know, we have been doing day in, day out general clubs for students, etc. But uh, we don't get much involved in assessing or uh, authenticating or validating the uh, qualitative research. Do you have any tips for that? Right, sir. So, just like we have a uh, checklist for uh, checklist for assessing the quality of evidence in qualitative quantitative research. We have a checklist for consolidating criteria for reporting qualitative research. If you can write an email to me at my ID, I will send you that checklist. It's available online, so you can download it. Uh, we can pick those checklists and examine that article against that criteria. And then we can see that how well that fits in. But we have to be careful that it's a very comprehensive checklist. We have to pick up only those items which are relevant to that design. So it is called as CORIC guidelines consolidated criteria for reporting. No, are, are there any very salient things you know which you specifically look into uh, the quality okay. research which you don't we don't see here in the quantitative research? 
Right. The salient point that we check in qualitative is there an alignment between research question and methods that is chosen? Is there alignment between analysis plan and qualitative with the, with the research question? Uh, have they mentioned the number of coders? Have they mentioned their, uh, uh, let me say, coding plan transparently? Uh, have they mentioned, uh, let me say, how they, how they resolve the discrepancy when they are to investigate So, the checklist include this kind of items. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We just like we have internal validity and external validity in quantitative research. We have credibility and transferability in qualitative research. So, there are criteria for credibility. And there are criteria for transferability also. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Thank you, sir. Uh, would, uh, but, sir, would like to add something, or shall we? I think uh, it was very interesting talk. Yeah. You want to add yeah, something? Yeah. Yeah, Dr. Bhatt, I'm an unmuted, that's why he couldn't hear me. What weightage you give for the statistics in critically appraising the qualitative uh, uh, research? Weightage for the statistics? There is no statistics in qualitative research. Uh -huh. there are, if we use some numbers sometimes uh, and we do some kind of uh, a score calculation or something that's very limitedly done in systematic. So for others, there is no statistics. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. So, Arkoli wants to tell something. No, no, just I wanted to add that uh, the contextualization versus generalization. Because in quantitative research, all the time we are worried about the to what extent the research can be generalized to a bigger population. But in qualitative, I think our intention is how you can contextualize. We don't claim that this will be applicable and this can work in any setting. Settings are different. But we say very strongly that in this setting, this, this, this works. So that brings credibility. So this is a problem, inherent problem in uh, qualitative. Generalizability is poor, but contextualization is very high. And many times we are really interested in contextualization. Whether you talk about efficacy of a drug, whether you talk about acceptance, whether you talk about user friendliness of a particular public health policy, everywhere we see whether it works in that particular area. So this is the important question. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think uh, we had a very nice uh, talk and i think everybody has uh, enjoyed it and anything more any doubts or any clarification the promo is always available and yes, shall i close or uh, around the youth thank you thank you very much sir for uh, spending this evening to yeah. enlighten us in qualitative research uh, we are very um, grateful to you for accepting our invitation and addressing our faculties Thank you very much, sir. We will uh, keep updated about any queries which uh, arise from the participants. We will mail it to you, sir. Thank you, all the participants, for staying Thank patient you, enough sir. and uh, addressing this. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, sir. everyone. Thank you, sir.